Hello and welcome back for episode seven of this series, Why the Universe is Quite Disappointing, Really. In this and the next few episodes, I'm going to talk about cosmology. And I thought it would be good to start that sequence by talking a little bit about the Big Bang. Everyone has heard of the Big Bang, the Big Bang theory, not just the television program, but also uh, the theory of the universe. Now, when you hear the phrase Big Bang, you probably think of sound, that there must have been a big sound. And it must have been, because it gave birth to the entire universe, it must have been terrifically loud. So what I want to do in this video is to talk a little bit about how we can actually measure the sound of the early universe and how loud it was. And that will lead us to the conclusion, inevitably, I'm afraid, for this series, that the universe is really quite disappointing. The universe began with the Big Bang. The Big Bang was quite loud, but there are lots of louder things even on this Earth. And uh, so the universe is not as exciting as it might have been. So how can we talk about sound in the very early universe? Well, it's actually uh, quite analogous to the sound it, that happens in everyday life. So if I do this, you hear a sound. Now, it's a little bit complicated because I'm speaking to a uh, microphone and the sound that I make in this room gets converted into an electronic signal to, before it reaches you. But if you're in the same room as me and I do that, what happens is the sound waves travel through the room. Those sound waves are longitudinal waves. They're compressions and rare refractions of the air in the room. So what they consist of is variations in the density and pressure of the air. They're tiny variations in amplitude, but our ears are really well tuned and we can pick up those really tiny vibrations. So the same thing happens in the very early universe. Now, the early universe is much hotter than this room. Uh, it's much denser. The sound waves are much longer wavelength than our human ears can hear. But the physics is basically the same. So although we couldn't have survived, we, it was so hot in the early universe that our bodies would have been dissolved in uh, constituent atoms and particles. Um, so we wouldn't be able to actually hear these sound waves, but the physical properties are exactly the same. They're compressions and rare refractions of the medium that pervaded the universe. In that case, it's not air. It's a very, very hot, dense plasma. The physics being the same, we can just map over the language that we use to talk about sound waves in air, uh, our everyday experience and use it to describe what happens in the early universe. And that's what I'm going to do in the next few slides. The theory that we now know by the name the Big Bang has its origins in Einstein's general theory of relativity. Uh, Einstein's theory was picked up by two people in particular, um, in the centre picture there, you'll see Alexander Friedman, a Russian, and on the far right, uh, looking a little bit like Harry Enfield, I think, uh, is uh, the Belgian Georges Lemaitre. They took Einstein's theory and used it to construct a mathematical model of a universe which had an origin in time and has subsequently been expanding from that. That essentially is the basic idea of the Big Bang. We'll say more about that in future episodes, but the important thing at this point to realize is that these two, Lemaitre and Friedman, their models of the universe were for completely homogeneous universes. Now, for reasons that I've explained earlier, a completely smooth universe without any variations in density and pressure does not contain any sound because sound waves are vibrations and fluctuations in the medium pervading the universe. So although they were origin of the Big Bang theory, 
it's a misnomer for those original simplified models because they don't contain any sound. There's no bang in their model of the universe. In fact, it wasn't until um, much later that Sir Fred Hoyle coined the phrase Big Bang uh, to describe these origin, this, this theory of the origin of the universe. And he meant that to be facetious. He wasn't actually described, but particularly meant to uh, describe the physical properties of the early universe. So the mathematical models originally did not contain sound waves, so do not really describe a Big Bang. However, much more recently, we've actually been able to discover and measure very accurately the fact that the early universe did contain oscillations in density and pressure. And we know that because we see them, or we see their residue, if you like, in the radiation from the cosmic microwave background. This is a beautiful picture taken uh, by the Planck satellite. Uh, the other maps of part are all of the sky in microwaves that show these fluctuations of different uh, wavelengths and so on. So these tiny variations across the sky in the light coming back from the Big Bang correspond to variations in density and pressure at the time this light set off, which was 13 billion years in the past or more. And they're the imprint of sound waves going through the early universe. Now these waves are very long wavelength. The universe was very, very hot, but they are nevertheless acoustic oscillations and we can treat them in pretty much the same way as we treat sound waves in air. Here is a graph showing the spectrum of these oscillations. Now you don't have to worry too much about the, uh, the funny labels on the axes, just look at the bumps and wiggles in the graph. So these actually the measurements taken from the Planck data, which I showed you in the previous slide, and they show you that there's, uh, what you see in this uh, plot incidentally is very long wavelengths to the left and very short wavelengths to the right. So to keep the analogy with sound, low notes to the left, high notes to the right. And you'll see that there's more fluctuation amplitude around about one degree or so. Uh, that's a, a, an angle on the sky, which is how we measure these things, but it's basically a wavelength. And then, so that's like a fundamental note and then there's a couple of harmonics at slightly higher frequencies and then it damps away. So this is very much like a spectrum of a particular sound you might get from a musical instrument or something. Uh, more importantly for this talk, the height of the peak, that especially that first peak, uh, tells us the amplitude of the oscillations. And we can use that to turn these measurements into a statement, a pretty accurate statement about how loud these sound waves would be. Now, just to orient you a little bit, we're all, whenever we talk about sound in everyday life, we usually talk about decibels. How many decibels is it? I suspect a lot of people use that without that kind of language without really knowing what a decibel is or what it means. Um, but just to orient you, probably know that sounds over 100 decibels or so are pretty loud. Uh, the loudest rock concert would be might, maybe 120 decibels if you're close to the speakers. Um, airliners, jet engines and things are all very loud, pneumatic drills. Um, um, and then as you go down in decibel scales, you have very quiet uh, environments, you know, like a library might be 30 or 40 decibels, leaves rustling, things that are barely audible would be 10 decibels, and something you can hardly hear at all is zero decibels. So before we go on, I need to explain a little bit about what decibels are. So the key thing is that decibels are a logarithmic measure of the uh, energy or pressure variations 
corresponding to sound waves. In the context of sound waves I'm talking about here, decibels can be used in uh, other contexts too. But what you see here is basically L is the decibel level I've used here, and it's 10 times the log to the base 10 of the RMS, so that's, that's, that's a sort of typical fluctuation in the energy divided by some reference energy. If you're going to take the log of something, it has to be dimensionless. So you have to take the ratio of two things in order to get a sensible logarithm. Now for acoustic waves, the pressure variation, the energy goes as the square of the pressure variation. So, um, so when you do the logarithm, you'll find that that brings out a factor of two at the front. That's why there's a 20 in the front of the second equation compared to the 10 in the front of the other. Now, you don't need to know much about logarithms to realize that if uh, the RMS pressure fluctuation is equal to the reference pressure, which the reference pressure is chosen arbitrarily, I'll come back to that in a minute, then um, log to the base 10 of uh, P RMS over P ref is 1, log to the base 10 of 1, which is 0. Log to the base 10 of 1 is 0. Okay, so that's how you get the zero level of decibels. Uh, um, the, if the RMS fluctuation is the same amplitude as the reference pressure, then you have no decibels, and it's the threshold of hearing. You basically can't hear it. So let's just apply this to air and the Big Bang. Well, in, we're quite familiar with sound waves in air. And we know kind of what amplitude of fluctuations we can actually hear. And for that reason, the reference pressure is chosen so that zero decibels is at the threshold of human hearing. And it turns out that um, that level is something like 10 to the minus 10 times atmospheric pressure. So that would be the, a sound wave of that kind of amplitude, typical amplitude would be inaudible because it's lost in the ambient pressure. So that's all very well for the human ear and for sound waves in air, but we're going to apply this to the Big Bang, so we need to choose the reference pressure um, analogously. And the sensible thing to do is to say, well, actually, if you're living in the early universe, which you can't because it's too hot and too dense, etc., 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 but we could actually say, well, that's the ambient pressure then. Let's just take a reference pressure for the early universe to be the same fraction of the ambient pressure, which would be enormously high, actually. Uh, but it's just scaled in the same way as we, we scale things when we talk about um, everyday situations. So then it turns out that from the graph of the sound waves that I showed you in a, a minute ago, the RMS pressure fluctuations are about a few times 10 to the minus 5 times the reference pressure. Now that um, for the early universe. Now that is a statement that depends on wavelength because, you know, there's a peak where there's much higher pressure fluctuations and then there's uh, other um, wavelengths where it's lower. But let's just say a rough and ready approximation is a few times 10 to the minus 5. So now we can easily calculate how loud was the Big Bang in decibels using the definition in terms of the RMS fluctuation and the reference fluctuation, re reference pressure rather. We find that if the amplitudes are, uh, the RMS fluctuation is about 10 to the minus five, then you have about 100 decibels. And if it's 10 to the minus four, it's about 120 decibels. Now the peak wavelength for the microwave background fluctuations has an amplitude of a few times 10 to the minus 5. So its level at that particular frequency is somewhere between 100 and 120 decibels. It's actually something like 115 decibels, 110 to 115 decibels. It essentially depends a little bit on how you measure it. So 115 decibels is the peak loudness of the Big Bang. 
Let's go back to this picture and you'll see that it's 115, 110, 15 decibels is pretty loud. It's actually a, a, a loudish rock concert. It's almost the level of a, a air raid siren. It would certainly be uncomfortable for you if you were living in the early universe, but you would have melted and turned to plasma anyway, so it doesn't really matter that much. The point is that it's it's slightly disappointing. It's not ferociously loud as you might have imagined it would be. It's kind of comparable to everyday loud things. So now you're probably saying, well, that's a bit unfair. Give me, what do you mean by loud? What would be really loud? Well, a really loud sound would be one in which the fluctuations in pressure were of the same order as the ambient pressure. So the fluctuations are as big as the pressure, it's, uh, the, the background pressure. Now, if you work back through the decibel calculations, that would mean something like 200 decibels. That would be a shock wave. It would be a non-linear wave. They're not longer, those waves are not um, small perturbations on the background density, but enormous fluctuations. And those things happen on Earth. For example, the eruption of the volcano at Krakatoa in 1883 produced a shock wave that was about 180 decibels at a range of 100 miles. Now that was loud, really loud. And that's a lot louder than the Big Bang. So when people talk about the Big Bang, it's really uh, not as loud as you probably imagine. And in fact, uh, I think if I'd been in charge of it, I would have turned it up a little bit more just to, for fun. <laughs>